Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to the Springfield Methodist Church, Springfield United Methodist Church, or place where we Methodists in Effingham County and beyond gather here for worship through Sunday school and for first church and for an 11 o'clock church. Too. Amen. So we are glad that you are with us here. Come on in. On this warm, humid yeah. um, uh, Sunday morning, the second Sunday of August, in the season of Pentecost still, as we move forward in our church calendar. Um, it is important to know that um, we are, you know, part of this movement of Pentecost and the, the Holy Spirit is, is a key to everything. Our Trinitarian God is a key to everything. And this, this sermon series by Brother Ken and even in the Sunday School Lesson series, as we've discussed wisdom and the wisdom of God, and God is wisdom, and wisdom is God, or that godly kind of wisdom, we can also put in there that our Trinitarian God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, is very much a part of living a life daily in light of God's ways as we seek wisdom and allowing the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit, which lives in us, is a part of us Christians, and allowing it and to being receptive to it and using us as we daily walk in wise ways to be more like Jesus Christ, be more like God, um, and to make us more mature as we do this, um, as we look forward to that ultimate glorification, as John Wesley would say, of spiritual perfection and holiness um, in the likeness of God. So, we're glad you're here again. Um, it is the second Sunday of August. It is the season of Pentecost. It is August the 2nd. August the 2nd. Um, in the midst of circumstances of, of storms in the air and storms in the air related to COVID-19, God is with us in all circumstances. Um, in death, in illness, etc. God is with us. And our lesson today talks about um, wisdom. And we're going to look at it as we move to a new unit through the eyes of James. James, uh, the book of James in the Bible. James, the brother of Jesus. So before we go on and move any further, let us have a word of prayer. Father God, we give you thanks for the day, the gift of this day, the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy, you command us to do that. So in this age of circumstances, it seems of many kinds of storms, help us to observe and remember you on the Sabbath, Lord, to worship. Worship through Sunday school and worship through church. It is good to be corporately with other Christians um, and to feel the leading of your spirit as, as we do what we do to bring honor and praise to you. We ask your blessings upon the Sunday school lesson today, Lord, from the book of James in the Bible. May you be honored in what we say, what we think, so as to change us from the inside and to help us to be less of sin and more of you, God. We give you thanks. May you be honored in all. And we pray these things in your name, sir. Amen. Wisdom. Five Sundays in August. And we're going to move through the little book of James in the New Testament. If you will look at the board, you can see, um, as far as the quarter goes, and I'll review some things with you as we get into the lesson context and so forth, the many faces of wisdom. And if you will recall, we first started way back in June looking at the wisdom of God through the eyes of King Solomon and his Proverbs and those other lesser two writers of the Proverbs. But we spent, we spent most of the time speaking with and speaking about King Solomon and God's wisdom that he imparted upon King Solomon. And we spent time with that in June. And then the last unit, unit two, 
we actually looked at the wisdom of God through the eyes of the gospel writers. I'm going to change that to unit three because we have moved into unit three. We looked at the gospel writers of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as a matter of fact. Um, and the wisdom, God's wisdom, and the, 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 more specifically, um, wisdom of Jesus as a little boy and, you know, uh, growing up and being in his father's house. And, and then we looked at, you know, the wisdom of God in, in him being the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody gets to God except through Jesus Christ. Which in itself is the epitome of God's kind of wisdom. Of following the way. The way. And as a result of following God, we can live, following Jesus to get to God, we can live in the truth of knowing that we have a fulfilling life. A life here on earth and a life to come of which we cannot imagine. And that's what the Lord God wants all of us, wants for all of us. So we spent some time looking last week at the Gospel of John and, and discussing the way and the wisdom, of, the wisdom of Jesus that he gave out on that very, very somber night of um, Thursday before his crucifixion and a few hours before Jesus was crucified on the cross. When we looked at chapter um, 14 of John last week, so we've looked at the wisdom of God through the eyes of King Solomon in the Old Testament and the book of Proverbs. And we've looked at the wisdom of God through the gospel writers and, and at various times in Jesus' life that he lived on earth, um, specifically for about three years of his life. And, you know, a few dabbles when, when he... Um, um, was a little boy and so forth. And now we're moving into a new unit. This is unit three. Faith and wisdom in Jesus. Faith and wisdom in Jesus specifically um, from the book of James. The book of James. Um, we're going to look at verse, some verses from the first chapter of, of James. Now if I say James, what comes to your mind? Um, you know in our lesson, I, I always like to begin with a little pretest. A little more question to kind of get you to thinking, you know, as we talk about wisdom, we talk about this new unit of faith and wisdom in Jesus. Is your mind beginning to wander and think, hmm, what are we going to talk about today? And we're going to talk about it through the eyes of a guy named James. Well, who is James? What do you know of James in the Bible? What do you know about James? Well, um, surely most of you know um, that there are many James in the Bible. Um, James the Just, James the Apostle, James the Lesser, sometimes called. Um, this James, look it up. It's pretty interesting to read about all these James and how they um, um, are mentioned uh, very in brevity. Not much we know about any of them, um, including the one today. Uh, but very brief, but there are some James. There was James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, who became one of the disciples of Jesus. <clears throat> the James that we're talking about today is, God love him, is James, the brother of Jesus. Um, if you will recall, when Jesus went to preach and went back to his hometown of Nazareth in a past lesson, um, James... Uh, Jesus went there, and, and his hometown folk could not believe that an ordinary man like Jesus, a carpenter, could speak such wisdom when he went and preached in the synagogue. And they were amazed at his knowledge and, and the authority with which he spoke. And they said, you know, is this not the brother of Judas, the brother of James? Um, and, and his sisters are even here. Well, this is the James about whom we are speaking. This is James, the brother of Jesus. Jesus was from a, a, a family. He, he came from a normal, I use that term loosely, he came from a normal family. Um, and he had brothers and sisters and a mama and dad. So, we're going to look at 
the wisdom of Jesus and the, the faith and wisdom of Jesus and faith and wisdom today through the eyes of Jesus' brother. This is the brother of Jesus who wrote the five chapters in the book of James. And um, ladies and gentlemen, you know, James is often compared to, to the Proverbs. James talks about practical things of life, but practical things related to be a, of, of the related to being a Christian. And, and, and recall that this is James, a Jew who has now been converted to a Christian. And he is a Christian Jew who is 100%, who now is a 100% believer in who Jesus was. This James and his other brothers and sisters and his other hometown folk did not accept him at that time. Did not know, did not know who Jesus was at that time. Only after the events of the Passover and the last 72, maybe more, hours of, of Jesus' life here on earth and, and then through his resurrection and maybe even his ascension, probably so, did, did James even come to know more fully who his brother was? Um, quite interesting. It was this James that um, is going to be one of of Jesus' staunchest supporters after some time. This is the James to which, um, um, after the resurrection, Jesus um, became very familiar. This was the James that supposedly, according to church tradition, was the leader of the Christian church in, in, in that great city of Jerusalem. This is the James um, who began to spread the news of who his brother was. Um, this is the James that was also martyred uh, because of his stance and, and, uh, and how he supported his brother, Jesus, by preaching the gospel and becoming a leader in the church at Jerusalem, and he was killed for such. And tradition, I think, tells us um, that um, um, he was thrown from a, a pinnacle on the, in the temple in Jerusalem, and he fell to his death. But um, I read one historian, I think it was Josephus, a, a Jewish historian who even said that um, the fall did not um, kill him. And when he fell and hit the ground, he was clubbed to death and beaten to death. And became a martyr for his son. Excuse me, for his brother. Um, James was a praying man too. Josephus will also tell us another historical tradition. Um, tells us that um, James prayed a lot. And he was on his knees a lot. And that he had calluses. Um, because he, he spent his time kneeling before his heavenly father. Um, in prayer. Many things from practical things, you know, that we can learn from James that are very wise and showing and displaying wisdom about who Jesus was in the face of wisdom that we see in Jesus Christ and His Son, uh, God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Um, so we're going to look at the book of James, and we're going to read from the first chapter of James and the first few verses there in that chapter, and throughout the month of, of August, we will look at the, 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 the wisdom of Jesus, the wisdom of God through James, his brother. So, let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for, for um, your scripture. We thank you for your word and your Bible. And we ask you to bless it now as it's read. And may your spirit awaken our brains wherever we are, Lord. If we're watching this live or if we're watching this wherever or, or whatever, that, or later. That um, as we as we read your word, that, that you would uh, move through your spirit to open us up and to, to the reception of it, Lord, to, to give thought to it, to be changed, to share it with someone, to love God, to love you more, God, and therefore love others. 
and to share and to pray and to believe. And we pray these things in your name, sir. Amen. So, the book of James and I am going to get my Bible and we're going to look at the book of James chapter 1 and we're going to read some verses from this little letter, this epistle that James wrote. You know, to honor um, his brother and to honor God. And it became canon. It became scriptural canon. Um, James, arguably and more than likely, the first piece of literature that we have that became the Bible is this letter from James. Is this, not a letter, this epistle from James. Um, it may have been written, you know, we say probably that Jesus Christ left earth, um, you know, when he was maybe 33, 34, 35, somewhere around that time of frame, you know, time frame. He left this earth, he ascended and went up into heaven. Um, with, you know, his disciples watching and, and um, them being told, you know, just like he left, he's going to return one day. And James was there. James the believer was there at that time. Um, probably 20 years later, 25 years later, James began and wrote this about um, the gospel. He wrote... A, he, he, wrote a, he wrote something about the good news. He wrote about Jesus, about his brother and his teachings. Um, and he, here, here was a Jewish man who, who converted to Christianity, and he was a changed, redeemed man. And he wrote things down. So, arguably, this might have been one of the first things that became the Bible. The book of James became one of the first books, you know, in the Bible. So, let's read and see what we find out here. So, we look at some verses here. Um, less in context, we are done. Part B uh, on the screen says to, you know, James gonna, is going to talk about enduring trials. Um, and, and then seeking this wisdom. Um, and to understand, I wrote this under my conclusion because this is something that I hope that you kind of accepted. And as we've discussed wisdom in our um, Sunday school lessons, that in every part of life, in every aspect of life, that when God invites us to seek Him, to seek His wisdom, to seek His practicality, to seek His way of living life. Therefore, drawing into a deeper relationship with Him, loving Him more, love the Lord your God, God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then after that, love your neighbor as yourself, to love others. That's what He desires for us to do, and to share that with someone else. So here's the book of James. And let's, let's, let us look at the, fir, the first four verses here. Verses here, Enduring trials. And, and look at the even the little salutation at the beginning, the, the um, greeting part. And mine says, greetings from James. And here's the first, first chapter, first verse. This letter is from James, a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This letter is, and it is a letter, this letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. A slave to God. He calls himself a slave of God. Uh, some other versions might say a bond servant, which is like a slave. When you, when, you, when, you, when you hear the term slave, we, you know, we think of, of master, and we think of slave. Um, master, Jesus was, was sometimes called the master. God is our master. And then James was his slave, his bond servant. Um, and what does that infer? What, does, what comes to mind with that? You, you, it comes to mind here when writing about Christianity, the good news, and about his brother Jesus. It implies a complete devotion in this kind of master in 
and slave relationship. Um, it, it's interesting to see in this too that um, you know he doesn't say this letter is from James, the brother of Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus, who was from Nazareth, which was my hometown too. He, he, he does not, and, and throughout the whole entire book, if you read the, the five chapters, he really makes no allusion or connection to, to him being the brother of Jesus. And if you want to be specific to being the half-brother, you know, of Jesus, because Jesus had a family. But this is a letter from James who was a slave of God. This was from the James who probably, arguably, 35 years ago from this point, this was the, the, the James that was the brother of Jesus. The sons of Joseph and Mary. Now James could say this. This is from James. This, we, you know, as we paraphrase maybe and add to, uh, this letter is from James the brother of Jesus who was and is and will be the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the one who has come and will return. James had a different perspective now. He was the brother of Jesus, but he knew Jesus in a totally different light at this time as he was preparing to send this little letter off to... It is written to the Jewish Christians scattered among the nations. And he says, greetings. Written to the Jewish Christians um, scattered among the nations. Um, Jews were scattered everywhere at this time. Here's James writing to all the Christian brethren and sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ. Um, my Bible says the Jewish Christians. So, you know, we're specifically talking about According to James, Jewish Christians here. Um, Jewish bloodwise, Jews who, who love Jehovah God and practice Judaism, and um, um, formerly uh, Jewish Christians. Some would argue uh, about to whom specifically it was written, but, but we see here in this version, in this translation, it is written to Jewish Christians. And there were Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, in Judea. Um, there were Jewish Christians scattered all over the place. Um, you know, the Jews were scattered everywhere. You know, there were Jews that still were in Babylon and, and, and in that region of the world who never returned to the Promised Land. Um, you know, there's a small little remnant of Jews as descended from those, you know, even in Iraq to this day, in, any, in Iran to this day. So here's James, the brother of Jesus, who now knows that Jesus is the Messiah, the one to come to save, who is writing to his Christian brethren, who happen to also be Jews. And he says this, and the next little heading in my Bible says, faith and endurance. Faith and Faith and endurance. Faith and endurance. And he goes on to say this. Interestingly. Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. Let it be an opportunity for joy when you have trouble. When you have trials, let it be an opportunity for joy. Well, Interesting. What an interesting thing to say. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. James is informing his brethren and sisters in Christ at that time, as he informs us today in the 21st century, of remaining steadfast and enduring in times of difficulty, in times of trials, in times of tribulations, in times when your faith is tested. Okay? He's telling us to, 
to believe and take heart. And, you know, like when we read last week in, in the book of John, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me. If you believe in me, you also believe in God. And they're one and the same. Um, there's that insurance, assurance that he's always with us. Um, um, he is with us when we are tested. The Lord Jesus Christ is with us when we are tested. The Holy Spirit is with us when we're tested as we, you know, seek go through trials and, and tribulations and and um, stuff like that. And, and you know, we, we think about trials. And, you know, think about the, the Christians and the Jews at this time. If this was written, you know, um, around 50 or 60 A.D. in that first century of the Christian church, um, the, 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 there was persecution. There was stuff going on in the church at that time. Um, the Roman Empire was in charge, but you were supposed to worship the emperor and not God, Jehovah, and especially his come, his his coming son, Jesus Christ, um, that had come as the Messiah to save the world. And you know, when it gets te the teachings of the Messiah, when it gets the teachings of government and you know following the emperor. So, you know, new Christians were persecuted, they were challenged, and they had a difficult time too, not only because of the government, but um, economically, you know, socially, etc. And that was in the first century church. Today, oh my goodness, you know, today at this very moment in time, um, on August the 2nd, you know, 2020, um, we, we, we are enduring trials. Um, whether it's sickness or, or, or whatever it is. I mean, there's, we know, and it goes without saying, that every, t every day we hear something about COVID-19. Um, you know, and, and then we, which is a, a, a trial, a storm of life. There, there is um, a storm, you know, brewing and, and, and doing what it does, you know, um, off the coast of Florida. Um, and that really is a storm. And, and, you know, those things cause anxiety and stress and, and, and you know, things like that. And, um, here is James informing us to be strong and to rejoice. It says, you know, what does he say? He says, consider it an opportunity for joy. When your faith is tested, you will become wise, he tells us a little bit later. And it's going to build our patience. And we are going to have trials. We're going to have tribu tribulations and, and things that, you know, go on in life. Uh, Bernie McGee, I love Bernie McGee. I love his interpretation of Scripture, and it's always good to read other interpretations of Scripture and so forth. Um, and in, in the midst of trials and tribulation and deaths and, and stuff that goes on in life, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Paul tells us in, in Romans, you know, it is still important for us in Romans chapter 8. You've heard me say Romans chapter 8 is my favorite chapter, more than likely, in the entire Bible. But um, Romans 8, 28, probably one of my favorite verses. And we know that all, thing, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Um, we have testing in our life. We're placed in places where there's going to be adversity, there's going to be tragedy, there's going to be suffering. There's going to be stress. There's going to be anxiety. But the Lord, through James, tells us to you know, rejoice in that. It's hard for us humans to do that. Um, and, and know that, and, and to, to, know, to, to know and understand that God is going to, God has a purpose in the things that we deal with with daily in our life. Um, Bernie McGee says this, he has a high and lofty goal in view. We can know that God is working something out in our lives. Then he goes on to add this, this does not necessarily mean that we will understand what purpose God has in it, but this is building our faith. This is building our faith. He wants to produce good fruit in us, good things in us. He wants us to be enduring where he can use us and work with us and to make us more like, you know, like he is. 
Okay? So, let's continue. Um, let's see if I wanted to share something else here. Yeah, here we go. Um, one of the writers in, in our um, lesson, and let me find him here. He tells us that we're going to have trials. Um, and John Wesley, founder of Methodism. John Wesley, Wesley, and this was actually found in the um, um, advocate lesson from the Wesleyan Christian Advocate, the Methodist publication of, uh, of the Sunday School lesson. lesson. Um, there is an indication that James took seriously Jesus' invitation to be perfect, therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. John Wesley also took this invitation seriously. He believed that we could become perfect in love in this life. He did not mean that we would be free from mistakes and temptations and failures and trials and tribulations. Rather, Wesley believed that through God's grace, his sanctifying grace, a person could have a heart that was filled with the love of God and neighbor and neighbor. And as, quote, having the mind of Christ and walking as he walked. Having a mind that was guided by the wisdom of God. By the wisdom of God. Which leads to the next part of the scripture. Um, you know, John Wesley, um, kind of a practical guy, and you know, the different means of grace as we are moving toward perfection and holiness in the midst of circumstances and in the midst of enduring those circumstances with God and the Holy Spirit working with us and still mind uh, molding us and transforming us, we are being moved and made into something better. And as a result of that, becoming a better person, more like God, more like Jesus, and then with, with um, John Wesley doing the same for other people. Social justice and so forth. So, um, we're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulations. we got to rely on God. And God is working something out. Um, I hope my faith would remain strong and steadfast when things happen. And you know, for God, God sees even days that are stressful for Keith, and they're not big, big things that are going on. It's not cancer. It's not death or anything. I would just hope that I can rely and believe what James is saying here and what God is saying, that my faith would remain strong. And for me to realize at that time when things are not great, that God is working things out for me to be a better person. And he does that for everybody else. We just have to be open to that and be receptive and, and the working of the Spirit in us. God's Spirit, you know, in us. So he goes on to say, in seeking wisdom in verses 5, look at that, in verses 5 to 8, he says, if you need wisdom and if you want to know what God really wants you to do, you ask him. And he will gladly tell you. He will not resent your asking. But when you ask him, verses 5 to 8, yeah. Be sure that you really expect an answer. For a doubtful mind is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. People like that should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. They cannot make up their minds, and they waver back and forth in everything. So here is James telling us to ask God for wisdom. We ask God for wisdom. Um... Dr. Spurgeon was a great writer. He said this, We are so ready to go to books, go to men, to go to ceremonies, to anything except God. Consequently, 
The text does not say, let him ask for books, nor does it say, let him ask for priests. It says, ask God. James tells us to ask God for wisdom. We are supposed to seek and ask God for wisdom. And even before that, when we ask for something, what is God inferring and implying here through James? We pray. We pray. We have to be in conversation with our God, in seeking wisdom, in enduring trials. We have to be in conversation and in a relationship with Him. God is stalking us as is the devil stalking us. And he would like to take advantage of trials in life to, to stalk us even more. Both of them. But we have to be receptive to the good and the bad. And to stay away from the bad. And to stay away from sin. That self, self, indulgent indulging nuisance that is always around. It's always around. Sin. We are, whoa, what's that? What's that? We, we have a bent to sin. But we are also created in the image of God. And, and here James is telling us to be in prayer um, about things. To ask God. And you've heard me talk about as we discussed wisdom. For us to be in prayer and to seek the wisdom of God daily. And that's what James is telling us to do here. But when we do do it, when we seek after this wisdom, it's going to be consistent with what is in here. In addition to praying with God and to talking with God and to being in relationship with God, we also have to be in this. And as a good discipline, every Christian should read this daily and pray daily, daily, and to be in relationship with his God. And how do you do that? You pray and you talk to him and you read about it. Truth. Um, a lot of us know about God, but do we know God? A lot of us know about God, but do we know God? That's key. That's a very important key. And I'm, I, um, I am preaching to the choir. I need to be better. I need to do better. But understand also that by the grace of God, I do what I do. And God does what he does. Um, so God's with us. He's with us as we go through difficulties, and he wants us to seek after him. He wants us to seek his wisdom daily. Um, it, it, and, and, and to um, follow in his ways. But he does not want us to be double-minded. Um, to not doubt. To not doubt. No that when we pray to God and we're in conversation with Him and we ask Him to give us wisdom, we have faith that He will impart it upon us. Don't let us be a doubter as we seek and ask in faith about this wisdom. Um, one of the other writers says, ask in faith. Our, our request for wisdom must be made like any other request that we make. It must be done in faith, realizing and knowing, without a doubt, God's ability and the, God's desire to give us the wisdom. To give us the wisdom. Um, Spurgeon, Dr. Spurgeon, he said this, um, you know, dear friends, that there is a way of praying in which you ask for nothing and get it. Faith, not doubting, 
knowing that God hears our prayers. And we may wonder, wow, you know, why hasn't God answered prayer? God answers prayer every day. Um, yes and no in prayer. But don't let us be tossed by the wind. Um, um, don't doubt. I wonder. I wonder if, if you know, um, James knew about Jesus walking on the water, heard the story, and, and then, you know, Jesus was asleep on the boat. Peter tried to walk on the water. Um, he saw the tumultuous water around him and lost a little bit of faith and he began to sink and the Lord Jesus Christ saved him. I wonder if James heard about the story and was around every, anywhere. Um, um, like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Um, the man who is not thoroughly persuaded that if he ask of God and he shall receive resembles a wave of the sea. A wave is something that is in continual agitation. We do not need to be that way with our God. We have to have faith and believe. And to be wise in seeking this wisdom that God, the God of our faith, is going to provide and take care of. Um, writer goes on to say this, A wave of the sea is a fitting description of one hindered by unbelief. A wave of the sea is without rest, and so is the doubter. A wave of the sea is unstable, and so is the doubter. A wave of the sea is driven by the winds. And so is the doubter. A wave of the sea is capable of great destruction. And so is the doubter. We should not be a double-minded Christian. To ask God for something and to ask Him for wisdom, as a matter of fact, and then not to expect Him to give it to us is, 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 is um, being double-minded. To be in the middle ground between faith and unbelief is to be double-minded. And we should not be double-minded Christians. If we are asking, and if we're asking young people, old people, wise people, if we're asking for something, do so knowing that um, beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is willing to liberally share that with us. He's going to share that. Okay, so, um, James, faith and wisdom, faith during times of trial, and constantly seeking that wisdom, that is much a relationship with, with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, of living um, as He lived, Jesus, and being wise in many things. Um, the lesson writer says this at the, as, at the end as he concludes the lesson, which is a, a good thing. James tells us that our most pressing need is always God's wisdom and that we are unable to live a life of faith without God's wisdom. Can't live that way. We have to seek God daily to live daily. We have to be in tune with Him daily through conversation and through Bible reading. Bottom line, not meant to offend anyone, but we have to pray daily and read our Bible daily. It is important. Um, and you know what? It's going to improve our relationship with God first, and then therefore other things fall into place and it improves our relationship with others. It improves and helps us to be filled with the love of God, to love like God, so we can therefore love others. In the midst of many, many circumstances, patiently enduring and abiding, abiding in God, and so forth. James tells us this. So, 
We need to seek God. Seek God so he can make us into what he wants us to be. Seeking God and the wisdom of God so he can make us what he wants us to be. Okay? Faith and wisdom from James. And that's the first chapter of James. But let's pray. Father God, help us to seek wisdom. Help us to know that you're with us in all things. Help us to seek after and to live daily in light of how you would want us to live. Relationally with you first, Lord, and then with others later. We ask your guidance in all things and help us to seek you. In the midst of circumstances, whether it's death, Lord, COVID-19, a tropical storm, sickness, anxiety about school, we know you're with us in all things. We give you thanks, Lord, as we sum up and finish today's Sunday School lesson. That you are our God. You're the great creator God of this universe. You are the great creator God who sent a loving, redeeming son to save us from our sin. Help us to share that with someone, Lord, and to go out in the world to love you more and then to love other people too. Because that is what you want us to do. We do pray for our country, the United States of America. We give you thanks for it, and man, you have blessed us. Continue to bless us, Lord, but continue to work on the people here. And, and I know you never give up, but may your spirit make us strong to serve you in a good way. And Lord, may our leaders seek your will, God's will, God's wisdom in everything they do, including our president and our Congress. We give you thanks for our military, for, for what they do. Those that serve, Lord, not only in the military, those that serve in, in first responder capacities. We thank you for them. We pray, Lord, especially for educators. We pray, Lord, for every person that works at a school. From the principal down to the custodian, Lord, they all help make things work. And we pray your spirit would work in us to be your hands and feet in this world. At school or wherever. And Lord, we also pray for kids. Pray for students. And we pray that they would follow your way and be in your way in the midst of a trying world that is always a world that stalks after them, Lord. Things in the world that stalk after them. But help them to know that you are stalking too. Thank God, God, that you stalk and that you're after us always. And help us through your spirit to be open to that stalk, to be wise. And Lord, I'll pray to end this prayer now, Lord, um, that you go with us and help us to ponder what we've been discussing in Sunday school and church today. And may you be honored in all things that we do. And we pray these things in your name, sir, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So y'all have a great day. It is the Sabbath. Enjoy it. Keep it holy. And be in prayer about our country and about schools. And um, to be in prayer with, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to be good people, better people, and to love God and to love others as a result. And to be helpful, kind, and to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world. So thank you. Have a great day.